to uh, introduce Michaela Smith from York University, who's going to tell us um, using travel and dietary behaviours to understand healthy, low carbon lifestyles, something which I think is you know, particularly relevant these days and not just to our generation, but so to future generations. So over to you. Thanks. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So I'll just follow that by saying I am a PhD student at the University of York and so I'm using UK Biobank for part of my PhD research and I'm really pleased to be here to be able to present some of my findings to you and I hope that you find them interesting. So first a bit of background. Um, my research is in a bit of a different area from the more biomedical research in UK Biobank. So at the University of York, my research is part of the HOPE project, and HOPE stands for the Health of Populations and Ecosystems. And it's an interdisciplinary project where we're working to align human health with the health of the natural environment. And within this broad area, my research is focused on gaining greater insights into healthy, sustainable lifestyles and ultimately how we can best facilitate them. So first of all, what do we mean by healthy, sustainable lifestyles? It's a broad concept, but basically we're talking about engaging in behaviors in lifestyles which promote human health and also have low environmental impacts. Obviously, there's lots of different environmental impacts that we can be concerned about, air pollution, land use, biodiversity. I'm particularly focused on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And this is because there's many explicit links to human health in this area. There's lots of health impacts of climate change, but also there's a large amount of data available and evidence related to the impacts of our behavior. So for example, at the level of individuals and households, two of the sectors with the greatest greenhouse gas impacts are transport and food consumption. And both of these have explicit links to human health through physical activity and diet. And as a result of this, a shift towards these lifestyles that are more sustainable, more lower in carbon, is actually having the potential to create co-benefits for public health. And as an illustration of this, in 2009, The Lancet said, climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And in 2015, they said, tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. So a bit of a shift in that area. So what type of shifts are we talking about? Well, within the areas of public health and environmental policy, there's two priority behavior areas where we have health and the environment aligned. And these are really promoting shifts from car use towards walking, cycling, and public transport use, and from higher meat consumption of and animal products to more plant-based diets. Now, I think the health and environmental problems associated with car use are fairly obvious, but with meat consumption, it can be a little more indirect. So I'll just go into a few points about that. So we're concerned about meat consumption because livestock production is actually the major driver of greenhouse gases in the agricultural sector. And there's many reasons for this, but the main one is cattle and sheep actually produce methane as a byproduct of their digestion. And this is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So um, other studies have also shown that beef production, for example, requires 28 times more land, 11 times more water, sorry, and uh, five times more greenhouse gases than other types of livestock. And if we compare it to plants, beef and lamb actually produce 250 times more greenhouse gases compared to legumes, say. Um, on the health side of things, a similar story. We know that overconsumption of red and processed meat is associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and mortality. And because of this, the current recommendation is that we shouldn't eat more than 70 grams per day. 
So where do we currently stand then in the UK with regard to travel and diet? Well, we know that most of the trips we make are by car most of the time, and many people eat too much meat. So just to show, show you some data on this, this is data from the National Travel Survey that shows that 64% of, peop of people in England make, or sorry, 64% of the trips are made by car. And here's some data on diet, which shows that 40% of the population actually exceeds the red and processed meat guideline, and only 27% eats enough fruits and vegetables. Now, these are obviously averages for the whole population, but we know that averages are made up of many different population groups, and so we have people that are above the average and below the average. And from a public health perspective, these extreme groups are actually of greater interest to us, because we really want to know who is eating the most meat, who is eating the least meat, who is driving the most, who isn't driving. And so we're starting to get a good picture of this for travel and dietary behaviors individually. But when we start thinking about lifestyles, we want to start thinking about multiple behaviors. And we actually want to know, do these extreme behaviors go together? So do people with the highest car use also have the highest meat consumption? Do people who use active travel, walking and cycling also eat a healthy low carbon diet? And at this point, we really don't know because most research in this area has focused on single behaviors in isolation. So we don't really understand people's lifestyles overall. To truly understand people's lifestyles, we need to start to look at different behaviors and how they may interact or intersect. So to give you an example of this, um, if we take cycling in and of itself, it's obviously a healthy, low carbon behavior. But to understand the full impact of a, fight, a cycling lifestyle, we need to understand what's fueling the cyclist. So to use an extreme example, a cyclist that is fueled exclusively by calories from cheeseburgers actually would have the same carbon emissions as two people driving a fuel efficient car. <laughs> So, um, given this context, the aim of my research was really to start to understand how travel and dietary behaviors are patterned together across the UK population, and I particularly wanted to look at the prevalence and patterning of healthy low carbon lifestyles. So for my methods, I obviously used UK Biobank. Um, I actually used the subsample who filled out the 24-hour dietary recall questionnaire, so I'm not sure if some of you did that. Um, I also looked at travel behavior, so I looked at um, whether people use car, public transport, or walking for both non-work travel and commuting travel, and how much time people spend driving per day. And then for dietary behavior, I looked at how much red and processed meat people eat, how much fruit and vegetables, and then more broadly, um, two measures of habitual diet. So do people ever eat red and processed meat or ever eat any meat at all? Um, for my analysis, I'll just be very brief. Um, I used a form of cluster analysis. And basically, this is just a way to identify homogenous groups from a heterogeneous population. So thinking back to the averages and the extremes, it's a way to pull out all those extreme groups from the overall population average. Um, individuals are classified into different subgroups based on their behaviors that they reported on the questionnaires. And I looked at this separately by gender. Um, one of the things that's actually strange about this method is it actually doesn't work well with really large samples. So in Biobank, that was actually a problem, and I had to take a random sample of the overall data to run my model. So the samples I used for this are actually quite small, but then I validated it in the larger data set. So after I identified each group, the final step was to then characterize it as higher carbon, lower carbon, or mixed. 
And this was based on the distribution of travel and dietary behavior compared to the gender specific average. So if we look at the bottom for healthy low carbon behavior, if a group had uh, red and processed meat consumption that was below the sample average and fruit and vegetable consumption that was above the sample average, then that was considered healthy low carbon. And if a group predominantly used a non-car form of travel, so walking, cycling, or public transport. Okay, so what did I find? These are the results of the models. Um, on this side, we have females, and there were 10 different groups. And on this side, we have males, and there were nine different groups. So the size of each segment corresponds to the prevalence in the population, and the color corresponds to the carbon rating. So red is higher carbon, green is lower carbon, and then blue is mixed. And obviously we can see that the larger groups are red and the smaller groups are green, which is what we would expect based on what we know about the overall prevalence in the population. So there's another way of looking at the data to see some of the patterns. So on the y-axis, I have meat consumption, and on the x-axis, I have car travel. And you can see again that the largest groups have higher car travel and higher meat consumption, but we can see that the meat consumption among males is higher than for females. Other patterns in the data, there's some smaller groups that had lower car travel, but average meat consumption, and then some very small groups that had very low meat consumption, but average car use. So I'll go through some of the data in a bit more detail, some of the groups. So if we just look at females for simplicity, who were the lower carbon groups? There were five of them, and they represented 15% of the population. So these were public transport commuters with average meat consumption, walking commuters with low meat consumption, two groups that didn't eat very much meat, low meat non-commuters and low meat mixed commuters, but both had very high fruit and vegetable consumption. And finally, uh, cycling commuters. And these were the very smallest group of all, but they were also the most low carbon group as they had low meat consumption and high fruit and vegetable consumption. So also interesting were the mixed groups. And these were groups where their travel and dietary behavior went in the opposite direction. So there were two of these, um, public transport non-commuters with higher meat consumption and low meat car commuters with high fruit and vegetable consumption. And both of these were fairly small. And then finally, we have the higher carbon groups, which makes up the majority of the population. And these were exclusive car commuters, so people who only drove their car and had higher red and processed meat consumption. Mostly car non-commuters who had high meat consumption and then mixed car commuters. So they mixed car use with walking or cycling or public transport. And that group actually had the highest meat consumption of all the female groups. So just to compare that to males, um, most of the groups were the same approximately. Um, the exclusive car commuters, the mixed car commuters, the public transport commuters, and the two low meat groups. Um, some of the interesting differences were there were no walking commuters among males, so that group didn't exist at all. And um, for cycling, the cycling commuters among males drove their cars more and they ate more meat than among females. So they weren't the most low carbon group. Um, in contrast though, the three non-commuting groups actually drove cars less than among females, so they were more lower carbon. Okay, so bringing this all together, what can we say? Well, less than one-fifth of the population of UK Biobank has a lower carbon lifestyle, but we saw that this was exhibited over many different patterns and combinations of behavior. So there's many different ways 
that people could have a lower carbon lifestyle. However, only 5% had a healthy low carbon diet and a healthy low carbon travel, so very, very rare. At the other end of the spectrum, we saw that at least three quarters have higher carbon lifestyles, but this was split out into several distinct groups. So again, not everyone was the same. People were engaging in different behaviors. And then finally, there were smaller proportions that have mixed lifestyles. So to conclude from this, we can say that yes, examining travel and dietary behaviors together can give us greater insights into the full impacts of different lifestyles. Completely healthy low carbon lifestyles are very rare, but there are some people that have partially or predominantly low carbon lifestyles. We saw that higher carbon behaviors also seem to go together, but high car travel seems to be more concentrated than high meat consumption. So ultimately from this, we still need more research into the best ways of shifting the higher carbon groups, understanding the motivations and drivers of the lower carbon groups, and looking into the dynamics of multiple behaviors over time. Thank you.